And while we're getting started, I'll ask a, a first. Morgan, you, you talked a little bit about conferences and uh, when we met and a little bit in your talk. I think for many of the, um, the teams, um, they or the head of their labs attend academic conferences and some and have some speaking opportunities at trade uh, organizations. And I think that's a tremendous place to meet potential customers and do customer discovery. Can you tell me a little bit about that, that part of your, your journey? Okay, um, let me think. So yeah, it's very important for us. Um, we probably go to 10 or 12 a year and um, um, and, and for our industry, or the area that I'm involved with, the, you can see the accelerator world is into different areas. It could be medicine, it could be ironing plantation, it could be discovery science and so forth. So we go to each and interestingly, um, I, I really like the part where the students are, they have to do discovery science. I mean, I know I talk about a product eventually or whatever, but there's, there's actually science that they're writing about. And so that's really important. I just, I just love encouraging that. and. And that's what they're talking about. And, um, and then it's interesting, when we had less money earlier on, that's the main way we did our, our connecting. And in some ways, it's better than going through a trade booth because people don't perceive of it. People feel comfortable to come up to the speaker or the poster, depending on how the presentation's done. And they have, they go, oh, that was really neat. And you'll have 30 people come up and, and asking about it and da 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 da. And so you can have a really nice exchange. We also do, normally at these scientific conferences, there will also be a trade part of it. So there's a booth that people can come up to, but often people are kind of scared to go and talk to the sales type of people unless they have an actual project. So this other kind of way is kind of neat. You can just casually talk and exchange ideas and, and make connections and, and so forth. So that's part of it, yeah. Great, thank you. Questions? Do you want to go? <laughs> uh, whoa. <laughs> Start by saying uh, four presentations that really resonated with me. Um, I'm a fairly technical person as well, and I'm, in the last few years of building a business, I've learned a lot about the human component and you know the, the sales and marketing and the stuff that you think is, is easy when you just sit in the lab and then you get to the human parts of it and you go, oh, oh okay, I need to learn. So anyway, four great talks. Um, as four people that run companies in the BC interior, what do you say to the age old question of how you find talent in smaller cities? Do you bring it in? Do you build it up? Do you do a combination of both? Um, I guess I'll ask all four of you and just let you free for all it. Okay, I'll, I guess I'll start. Um, so uh, it's amazing. I think in, um, uh, in this day and age with the internet and so forth, I, I find it actually just, um, we almost don't advertise. We're getting inundated with people trying to work with us. Uh, we live in Nelson. I imagine the same would apply to Kelowna. It's a beautiful place to live. Cost of living is less than other places and there's skiing and, and lake and mountain biking and all these things and, and a lot of techie people in particular, if that's the nature of the business, love that kind of lifestyle. So we're getting inundated with people trying to work with us. So in a sense, it's, it's sort of taking care of itself. Um, I think, um, yeah, so that, that, that's one slice of it. There's more to say, I'm sure. Yeah, I, w I would say the same. We have a lot of people come to us. Um, when we set up Core Health, 15 years ago, we made it a completely virtual company. So every one of our tools, everything we do can be done from any computer anywhere. So we have employees all around the world now. <clears throat> That's true Excuse too, me. yeah. Yeah, so, and also what we do is we have a bench, we call it, of people that want to work with us and we've kind of vetted them so that when we, we know two or three salespeople, we know two or three wellness people, we know programmers or, where to get programmers. So we kind of are setting up our next tier as we go. Um, for my company, uh, when we first moved to Nelson, I, I knew nobody in technology there. And in fact, technology was one of those things that was completely underground. Everybody was a contractor for a company outside of the region. And what actually transpired is over the past 10 years, we've now grown to a group of over a thousand people in Nelson that are all technology contractors. 
And so it's through that means that I've been able to grow my team. Now we've got a team of 12, uh, four of them that are full-time and uh, the other eight are contractor investors. So I really got to hand pick uh, a lot of the talent that I had and it was through a couple years of knowing what they were doing on a day-to-day -day basis and what value they could bring to my company. So now we search for outside talent that we can't find in the, in the Kootenays and a lot of that happens to be maybe in the technical sales side where someone doesn't have maybe the sales experience but they have the technical aspect. So it's more about just filling in the blanks now for us. Yeah, so first, I really caution you to uh, watch limiting beliefs. So if you believe that you're gonna have trouble finding talent, here you will. And, and I, I remember six years ago when I, one of my failed attempts to try to grow my company, I thought, well, I'm gonna have to use recruiters, I'm gonna have to pay a lot of money to, and I gotta convince people to, live, to come live here. People wanna come live here. And there, I mean, it's helped too, the ecosystem here has grown quite a bit, uh, but I, I would say for sure all the community involvement and you know running a tech meetup and, and becoming respected helps a lot with the tech talent. And plus, I, I actually don't care where, where people live exactly. Like I, I want to attract the top. We're building a plus high performance team. Uh, I would love for them all to be in the Okanagan, but it's just not necessarily practical. So we're, I mean, it is our business. We do remote work. So. Um, we actually, I live in Penticton. I, I, we only have three people that are actually in Penticton, and then uh, Summerland, Beachland, uh, West Kelowna, a couple Kelowna, a couple in the Ukraine, six in Calgary. Um, so yeah, I, I think just yeah, don't don't focus on whether or not you can hire the talent. It, it's people. People are there. Another question. So I have two questions, can I? Okay, so my first question for all of us, like for, for all of you, uh, how much is it, imp because you all guys are uh, doing your business in your own specialty field, in your own field, how much is it important to start business uh, in your own field? Like someone is an engineer or software designer, but he won't do any business which has nothing to do with that thing. Is it advisable or not? And my second question is about, you showed uh, your books collections, and in that, there was a one book that was a lean startup. How much is it important to think lean while starting your business? Um, I'll, I'll just start with that. Um, we never raised any money with Core Health, so we've built it um, just from bootstrapping. So it was very important to be lean <laughs> when we didn't have investment income. So, um, yeah. With Core Health, the other company, I'm really interested in learning about raising money. So I don't know how lean it will be. We'll we'll see, but I recommend it, especially if you're building something physical. What was the other question? So my first question was, how much is it important to start business in your own oh, expert own. area, rather like if someone is like a software tech, but he doesn't want or she doesn't want to start business in software in something. Else, does it advisable or not? I have seen, I'll just take this one really quickly, a lot of people in the tech industry, as in my 15 years in this, this city, people that aren't programmers starting tech companies struggle a lot because they don't understand what programmers are telling them or they might not be getting the truth from programmers. So that's my experience. I find a lot of people will still kind of say, fake it till you make it but you know what, you're gonna be called out very quickly when you step into one of those rooms where they can, they can read your poker face very quickly. And in fact, you know, that's uh, I think one of the things to, to keep in mind is if, if you're not passionate about it or it's not your area of expertise, you might not wanna go down that path because just chasing money or, ch or chasing an idea, you wanna have that investment into it. And usually your core skills or your best abilities is gonna be your superpower. Um, I can speak from personal experience to that. Like I said, like I don't have to be running a software company, and, and actually now that I'm, I'm, you know, in a, a retail business and then a, a product company, it's kind of interesting. But I, I think there is no right way to run a business, and um, I, I find there's really huge value for me being a 20-year experienced software engineer. Uh, my employees respect it. Uh, I, I'm able to understand when, you know. Software is not a linear process. Like I understand when it's someone just isn't good at their job, and I understand when there's been a technical challenge that was unexpected. Um, 
so you know, I, I think having domain in your field is really excellent, but also some lessons for me too. My first uh, more than a decade of my company, I was working as a software programmer, and I enjoyed it, and I liked it, and uh, it wasn't really until I started letting go, even about uh, even a year and a half ago, I was still writing a significant amount of code here and there. But it wasn't until I, I let go and started to really delegate and, and try to understand what it means to, to grow a business because it's, yeah, it's, it, it, the domain knowledge is nice, but there's, there's, like, always seek out opportunities for learning is my advice. And, and I guess I would just add that I suppose if, if using a person as an example, doing that, if the person loves the other thing that's outside their field, then they could probably do it. Like, I think you have to love whatever it is. So it may not necessarily be in their area of expertise. And if that's the case, maybe it could work. <clears throat> yeah, I think it could. I'll just add one more thing. My second company, I know nothing about insulin or physiology, <laughs> but there's people on the team that know a lot. I just need to know how to sell it and say, ah, I'm going to get Jonathan on that one. <laughs> if, when I get a question, I don't know. Just to uh, follow on comment, I'd love to have you speak, Anne-Marie, to it a little bit. You mentioned um, giving your clients the opportunity to add functionality um, to the next release. Um, and I was thinking about the possibility of indicating to a client that you could design their solution together with them and that that would create a real bond. And I, I, mm -hmm. I was very interested in that business approach that you talked about. If you could talk about it for a minute or two, that would be great. Um, yeah. Actually, you probably run into that a lot, Keith, because you build custom software solutions. Yeah. So we do spend a lot of time with our customers and when they come across something, they're gonna, they want to set up a wellness program a certain way and our platform doesn't support it, it's like, my thought is, oh, that's reasonable, it should, we'll fix it. But if it's something that they want, very specific, that doesn't make sense, then they pay for it and that makes a really good relationship. That, that it's very cut and dried. Yes, this works for all of our customers. We'll cover that cost. That's really specific to you. You're going to cover that cost. So uh, other than that, that's all I can say. People understand that well. I really like the idea you, you said about almost the early adopter thing and then working with them afterwards and getting some ideas. Yeah. I think I'm going to try that. I like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's very common. That, like I've been doing this for 20 years, and it's very common that, that people think, well, their their idea is, is fantastic, and I I really try to qualify my clients, and I and every once in a while I, I still fail. Like I have one guy with a, a he had access to market, he seen he had experience in the industry, but he didn't know how to sell, and the marketing company convinced him that uh, if you put Facebook ads on, he'd have a thousand users a month, and I said, well, that's not how it works. Like, you have to get out there and actually learn and, and find out what your customers actually uh, actually want and actually need, um, and if you're not spending time with the, uh, with the end users, it's going to fail. Like, I've heard of, uh, I tell this story a lot about uh, a company in the U.S. Uh, he consults with large organizations and multiple this group of hospitals spent a billion dollars on three different EMR systems, and every time they tried to roll it out, uh, the users said, we're not using it, and they just went back to paper, because you haven't got buy-in from the customers and found out what is their actual pain point and what do they actually need, uh, not just what's a cool idea. Yeah, hi. Um, great presentations. Thank you very much. It's excellent. Um, I built a company with a drinking buddy. Uh, we got to about 18 people, and we merged. And I think when we finally sold the company, it was about 50. Um, and the wheels began to come off at various stages along that way. We were all doers. Every person in there was a passionate doer, and nobody managed the company very well in retrospect. And I think we could have done a lot more, but we didn't transition. I'm intrigued because all four of you are doers. It's an interesting dynamic here. Of you need to know how to code. You need to know this stuff, but you're also all growing companies, and the sizes that each of you talked about begin to cross thresholds of management. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm intrigued about what your stories are, your thoughts, to a whole bunch of budding entrepreneurs who are passionate and want to do, but at a certain point, increasingly, you must manage. And you know, Peter Drucker famously said, doing must always be done, but managing seems optional. So if your doers are managing, then the managing won't get done. So I'm intrigued about your personal stories or experiences about that learning, that learning cycle. 
You want to start at the other end this time? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Actually, yeah, that's that's a huge thing, and it's on my on my mind constantly. And you know, a lot of what I do is I sort of go with my gut, and what do I not want to do anymore? What am I? What's holding me back? I remember when I hired uh, Amy as a project manager. She's now more of a COO role. And uh, I, remember, I was actually holding myself back from sales, and, it, and the reason was because I didn't want to manage any more projects, and it was a, a really difficult decision to hire. But at every stage of growth is really different, and I've been at companies that have grown to the 50 or 60 size, and, I, and you can do it really, really wrong. Um, and I think every entrepreneur is different too, right? So you got to look at what are, you, what are your strengths. So like, I don't want to project manage anymore. I'm actually really good at sales, really good at connecting with people, I'm really good at understanding people. So. Most of my job function right now is actually team dynamics within my team. So we're at 20 people now, and we actually ran into some problems when I sort of backed away from that. And I, you know, you you you, you give up, and then you give up too much, and then you take some back. And I realize that's something that I can't give up in my company right now. And if we're going to be growing from 20 to 50, uh, I have to make sure that that core group of people is, is, is right. And, and so I think it's, it really is just personal preference. But if you aren't thinking about how you're going to grow to those next stages, um, I think 15, 15 to 20 people is a really, really tough stage. Um, I'm looking forward to trying the 20 to 50. <laughs> <laughs> um, with my company, uh, you know, me being the jack of all trades, you know, it's, it's a tough transition to build a, you know, it's a welcome transition to start bringing on team members that can alleviate uh, a lot of the burden and, and finding the things that you're not so good at and having somebody you can pass it off to. Um, one of the, the best books that I've, I've read on that is called The Trillion Dollar Coach. And, and this guy was a, a lifelong uh, football coach and he was the, uh, the business uh, uh, advisor for, for Google and Apple and a number of these really big Silicon Valley startups. And really with him having a, a knowledge of team building it was a real eye-opener to see that somebody that you know, really just coached football could be one of the most influential people in some of these tech giants. And that at the end of the day, uh, you need somebody like that in your team. If it's not you, you need that person to help grow that team and manage those relationships. Because if not, it'll just come crumbling down and it might be just people butting heads that have the same ideas and they just can't find a way to communicate it properly. And, and that team dynamics really plays into it. Yep, here, here. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> um, as I grew Core Health, I would end up with a job that was kind of a loose end. And then when there was enough of that job, we'd hire someone to fill it. So I've done support, I've done marketing, I've done pre pretty much everything to, to get it to be a full-time job. And only in the last couple years have we started to put hierarchy into the company and we now have an executive team. So there's three executives plus myself. And I think my job to make the company most valuable is if it can all be done without me. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm getting into culture, I'm getting into coaching, trying to figure that out. <laughs> that's, that's a challenge. But um, so that's my latest role. And the more <coughs> I stay out of things, the better off it is. Nobody blames me when something goes wrong and you don't know how good that feels. Oh, that's too bad. So here's, how are you going to fix that? They even got me a co-op student to keep me out of their hair. It was wonderful. <laughs> but it is, it's a change in focus constantly. And it, you do see the changes, like us, about 25 people. And now we're rolling pretty good. Like, one day we have 36 people. I think we have job offers. Out. I don't know where we are. I don't even want to know how many moles we're feeding. But now we're growing quite easily. But I know another hump is coming. Yeah. Um, for us, I think we, we were quite helped by this uh, buy-in from New Zealand, so a larger company. And, um, and so everything earlier on went through me. And everything, whether it was technical or the business and you know, signing paychecks, whatever. And, um, and I didn't know how to, uh, how to get out of that role. I, I, I didn't really know how to do it. Anyways, with the, the company buying into us, they, um, they're a much bigger company and they you know, instituted uh, quarterly board meetings and, and things like that and helped me really. And another thing I liked about it, it wasn't you know, what you can imagine from movies or something like that, some sort of arrogant corporate sort of situation. It was very done in a, in a friendly way and in a thoughtful, common sense, we worked together. So that was nice. And so now we have, um, 
uh, we're still not that big on the sort of the 15-ish uh, sort of side, but we're hiring a lot now. So we have uh, people in different roles. So I'm no longer the, uh, you know, the, the CEO or president. Um, and, and we have you know, somebody doing HR and somebody doing kind of operations. And so I'm, st I'm still on sort of the R&D and um, kind of marketing and sales side. But even that now, we're filling in and planning for how is, and that's a tricky thing. It's actually a problem in the tech area. Uh, there's a number of tech people, at least in the accelerator world. I, how do you find that kind of entrepreneurial tech? It's, a, it's important for the sales. They have to be able to, you know, I have a PhD. I have to talk at that kind of level to connect with the, with the research groups and whatnot. And, um, but also to find people that have that interest. But anyways, we're working on that um, to, to try to find somebody to take over that as, that as well and to have it a, a self-sustaining enterprise. Can I, can I just add to that a little bit? So there, I, this is a really big focus of mine is, is, is getting the decision making out of my, my head. And it, it's hard, uh, entrepreneurs, you often can do everything, right? And it's, it's, it's hard to let go. So I've been, in one book, I think it was called uh, Giving Your Employees Your Brain Back and another one called Teaming About Superorganisms. And it really is getting, getting that decision making process and distributing it throughout the team. And so I've really, I've really expressed to my team, I was like, I want you guys to make decisions. You're okay to make mistakes. Uh, own them, uh, own the mistakes, we'll fix them. But I'd rather you, you go through that, pr that process because if you're waiting for me, like there was a time in the summer where I was gone four out of six weeks. And if they're waiting for me to make a decision, literally nothing is gonna happen. In the last two or three months, I really focused on that. And it's uh, absolutely inspiring to, to see what's going on. One of my employees, she came in and she said, I've never been in a company where I feel like I can actually make a mistake and I'm not going to be criticized for it. And so if, if I'm getting that feedback unsolicited, like that's, that's the kind of company I want. Yeah. That was really, really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, I promised to get you out at 7.30 and it's now almost 7.45. <laughs> so we're going to wrap it for the night. So thank you for coming. And I really want to thank Michael McCauley and his colleague, I can see him back there, Paul Matthews from Lawson Lundell for uh, supporting this event and uh, for being so involved in our program. And I want to thank all four of our amazing speakers for your really helpful insights and the time you've taken to prepare and be here tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you so Thanks much. So much. Yeah. Thank you very much.